Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Livingston, and I am joined here by Dr. Janine Marie Haugen. And today we are going to be exploring the topic of collective initiation. So, of course, we are right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And Janine has been putting out some writing about this historic time we're living through um, that we're going to have a chance to discuss. So Janine, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and I'm just going to read a quick bio before we dive in. So Dr. Janine Marie Haugen is a guide to the experiential intertwined mysteries of nature and psyche with the Animus Valley Institute and is on the faculty of Esalen Institute, Schumacher College, and Fox Institute for Creation Spirituality. Um, she is an amazing writer, and her writing has appeared in many publications, including Spiritual Ecology, The Cry of the Earth, Thomas Berry, Dreamer of the Earth, Parabola, and others. So thank you again, Janine, um, for being here with us. And as I mentioned, you've been writing about what we're going through right now with this global pandemic as a um, possible collective initiation. And I just want to read a little snippet from your writing, and then I would love for you to comment on that. So in your blog titled Chaos and the Collective Initiatory Journey, you say, the journey of the universe reveals many occasions of crisis where the unfolding cosmos might have imploded, but a never seen before capacity emerges instead. Homo sapien sapien may be in the kind of disillusion or chaos or cataclysm that often precedes and catalyzes creative emergence. We may be, as many have foreseen, entering a collective initiatory journey perhaps an evolution of human consciousness. So I, that's just such a beautiful um, piece of writing and I would love if you could speak to us a bit more about how you're seeing this particular time in history as a collective initiation. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful um, phrasing, Andrea, a beautiful way of turning that into a question. Um, yeah, this time is so immense in the sense that everyone, all the human beings are affected. And it seems that this is the first time that we know of where there's something that has affected every country, every community, every village, uh, although perhaps there are um, places where it's not in the awareness like it is with us in the West. And, uh, but nobody is immune from this. And so it has turned all of our thoughts in a similar direction. And our, um, our dread, our grief, um, our immense love for each other, uh, that there's a focus for us all that it's unlike um, Fukushima or uh, Katrina or these other really horrific events that affected places, you know, communities in places, but not necessarily the whole world. And um, <clears throat> So that, so that by itself seems unprecedented as far as we know, that our minds are looking at the same thing. And now, of course, we also have this with climate change, but, but we don't, climate change isn't for many people, it's not um, something that is a, as we know, it's not a daily concern for a lot of people, strangely, but it isn't. And, but this is now. And um, so, it, yeah, so it seems like, uh, it, and it's a big interruption of our uh, agenda, of our daily rhythms, of our, and so much 
mindlessness around, especially for those of us in the West, I think, um, with our prosperous lives and our, um, our rushing around and uh, a, a, a huge interrupt. And so, so what comes along with that is distress, not knowing there's a feeling of being lost, what's happening. Uh, we don't know what's happening. It's an underworld kind of time, uh, liminal. Um, yeah, it's, uh, there's something, the possibility of something new and different. Although we can see that the titans of industry are trying to get all the pieces put back together as quickly as possible. But I su su suppose it's not going to be a success. And that uh, what Joanna Macy has called the great unraveling, what other people have called collapse, um, seems to be with us. And that uh, a change of our human relationship with the other um, life with other life forms and with our earth is in change right now or yeah and it may not be uh, conscious or intentional for a lot of people but for other people very much so conscious and intentional <clears throat> yeah and like the uh, yeah that the, the the our way of life now you know, this is philosophy, so we don't have science about this. So it's a perspective, it's a view. But our way of life seems to be imploding. And the kinds of lives, you know, the uh, customary excess that we've had and, and uh, so forth, all the non-essential <laughs> life that we've pursued, it seems to be in a tremendous pause, at the very least, a tremendous pause. And nobody really knows what's on the other side of this. So, yeah. So and I, it does seem like people are wondering, thinking, um, mm, mm, yeah. Doesn't it seem? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering, just from your perspective as a vision fast leader, so leading these kind of initiations uh, through vision fast with Animus Valley Institute. And so seeing, maybe you could talk a little bit more about what you've seen as individuals go through this process of the unknown or maybe the underworld coming into the new. And yeah, maybe you could just speak a little bit about the vision quest quest as, as initiation on an individual level and how that might apply to us um, as a group yeah. right now. So yeah, so an image we often use in the kind of work we do with Animus Valley Institute. Now I have to say that it, this doesn't happen with everybody on every vision fast. It's a long journey usually and we call it the journey of soul initiation. And uh, it can take years, or, or it can be sudden for people who are really ready. But an image that we use frequently, it's such a great one, is the uh, butterfly emerging from the chrysalis, and which begins with the caterpillar. Um, the caterpillar goes through a number of molts where it just sheds its skin and grows another one. And it beca it's still a caterpillar. And it goes through a number of these until, and, and what it does, Andrea, is it consumes. This is the caterpillar lifestyle. Right. <laughs> consumes. And then at some point, the caterpillar, it, this changes and the caterpillar um, weaves itself a cocoon or a chrysalis, if it's a moth or a butterfly, it's slightly different. But, and, uh, and in that chrysalis or cocoon, that creature, caterpillar creature, completely dissolves, dissolves. 
dissolves. It is no <laughs> longer a caterpillar. It isn't a butterfly. It's soup. And then there are what uh, science calls imaginal cells, that they are there at the caterpillar stage and, at the, and in the soup. And the imaginal cells somehow tell this soup how to rearrange itself. Wow. 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 <laughs> wow. And these imaginal cells, as if the cells contain the image of the butterfly. And then this, so this new creature forms from that soup. And then when it's time, the creature emerges from the chrysalis. And it's a completely different kind of creature. Yeah. 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 Isn't that wonderful? It's beautiful. And mm -hmm. just thinking about, you know, the total unknown. It's not, it's not the caterpillar and it's not yet the butterfly. It's and yeah. of that it's even a scientific term, the imaginal cells, the imagining yeah. of the new future together. Yeah. Yeah. And that, so it seems like we might be in a kind of time like that collectively uh, in the soup, so to speak. We don't really know what is on the other side of that, you know, our chrysalis moment or our liminal time. But something seems to be breaking down. And um, yeah, so, so we use that image for our individuals in the vision fast and but it does seem to be um applicable to our culture now as well yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i know mm -hmm. one thing that um you do at animus valley institute too is connect people to the earth in different ways as they're going through this um initiation or in through this this butterfly into the, the chrysalis um and in one of your other articles you also wrote about us cultivating our human relationship with the dreaming earth and mm -hmm. that's still very possible during this shelter in place even if you're in the middle of cities um, or no matter where you are so mm -hmm. I if you can speak to us a little bit about how we might cultivate our relationship with the earth right now as a resource and as as a tool as things are are unwinding or possibly falling apart um, in our own lives or in the collective how might we connect with the earth or use that as a resource great question um well one thing that seems to me that we can always do it's always appropriate is praising praising Earth, praising the all the other beings and uh, and even if it's our um, a plant in our house or 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 the wood that our desks are made out of or and probably most people can get outside now so praising and really noticing and attending to the details of these other beings so we can praise in specificity and really honoring and letting the world know that we see and we hear and we feel these other ones. And one of the um, unanticipated effects of this maybe is that it changes consciousness. It's a consciousness altering tool. And we might go into it purposefully you know, like, oh, now I'm going to go out and I'm going to do some praising, but to uh, really let ourselves ride that wave, um, it changes perception and it changes our focus, our attention, and the world and the relation, our intimacy with the world is awakened in some way um, by this <clears throat> praising. And also, it can bring us to the edge of grief in our grief cry for the world. And, and that also is a way, as like with Joanna Macy's work, you know, to, that we're, it's a way that we share the grief uh, of the world. We share the grief, grief with other people. We share the grief of the earth itself. 
and um, hearing that what Thich Nhat Hanh calls the cry of the earth. And um, so these are ways of cultivating our intimacy and without expecting or wanting something for ourselves, but to really be offering our bundles of, of praise and beauty <clears throat> to the others. And let's see. Um, and, and through our deep listening, like if we go and enact praise and grief or, or kinds of um, ceremonies, like, oh, I just love the idea of people in city places doing ceremonies, like for trees. <laughs> Don't you love that? Love like, that. That you, you could be walking through a park and seeing somebody in a, like, offering water to the trees or something like that. Yeah, yeah I just love that. And, um, and, but these things all bring us closer and they, and they, um, soften up our psychic habits enough they can that we might hear in the we might not hear this through our ears but through other senses we might hear something um, from the world or we might notice images coming or deep emotion coming and uh and sometimes we might consider we might hold lightly the possibility that the world speaks to us in this way and that uh that it is said by some people i believe this from my own um work and life experience and uh but it is the world speaks to us in image mm -hmm. that sometimes we might be startled by what we're suddenly imagining or what or we get a big idea that we've never had before. Um, <clears throat> it may be, and again, holding this lightly, the possibility that in that psychic field where we are all joined with the other beings of the world and Earth, the body of Earth, it might be that these images are not ours not ours by ourselves. Right. And so to be really attending that, noticing that, and if we do, are so lucky as to notice that images or impressions or deep emotions are coming, that to uh, let the world, the world psyche, the other than humans, know that we've heard this. Mm -hmm. like, with some kind of gesture of yes and thank you and and yeah so something like that that's beautiful yeah i have so many comments that i want to say um sparked by what you just have said and one is just the simplicity i love the praise and i hear in that 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 can be done anywhere including in the house or in it's just this relation with the more than human world um, and how that can actually shift consciousness and mm -hmm. shift perception. So I love the simplicity and profoundness of that. that mm -hmm. practice. And um, yeah, and here at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, we very similar to the interbeing that Thich Nhat Hanh talks about. We, our hypothesis is that everything is interconnected and that when we tap into that interconnectedness, we can access innovation and well-being um, in a way that we can't in right. our, what we call our little c consciousness which is like our just ourself or the big c consciousness which is this much greater interconnected whole yes. um, and we've been doing this series of webinars talking about uh, noetic so noetic meaning inner wisdom so how do we tap into and really listen to our inner wisdom what you bring forward too is how that at the deepest letter level our inner wisdom is connected is interconnected with all it's that big c consciousness um with this relationship um between ourselves and others so i just it's beautiful mm -hmm. yeah yep. yeah so um i would love to ask you one final question and um of course people are having many different experiences um, 
from very, very challenging to a lot of opportunities right now. Um, and even in isolation um, or deep challenge, uh, you write in, in another snippet from your blog, you wrote, even in isolation, depth is available. Deep time, deep imagination, the deep river of soul. In solitude now, perhaps like a long vision fast, we might be more porous or receptive to dreams, waking images, or felt senses of what is now being asked of us as, individu as individuals and as a human family. So maybe you can, you've already begun speaking about this and maybe you just can um, talk with us regardless of our situation, how might we be able to tap into even more depth in this kind of listening at this mm -hmm. point? Um, well, when the, the shutdowns be, first began and the shelter in place and, and it was so destabilizing for people to suddenly be home and alone for probably a lot of people or, uh, the social groups broken up and so on um, and it I really did have the feeling of oh it's like a vision fast when you go out solo and and uh, and one thing that I've noted about the vision fast experience Andrea is that um, just eliminating these things food shelter or you know human built shelter and social contact it leaves a huge space and then what do you do in that space and uh, not having the routine of food and so in the case of this um, long uh, shelter in place or social distance and so forth uh, a lot of the things that have taken our attention have been eliminated. So there is a space. Now, I, and I'm saying this also aware that for a lot of people right now, a great deal of anxiety around um, <clears throat> financial, how to get through this and so on. I know there's a lot of anxiety. And um, so I'm not meaning to make light of that at all. And, uh, but during these times when there is, space when we don't really have to fill this time all up with activities and um you know entertainment or whatever um to be there's time for recording dreams like you said you yeah there's time for really attending again to our images coming really giving that attention rather than just they come they go that's it um yeah we don't have unless we create it we don't have all the 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 things that fill our days and occupy our time like traffic <laughs> or i'm trying or going out to you know happy hour or uh, going to see a film or or whatever, not that any of these things are bad. Uh, there's no judgment on that, but it's a it creates a different opening, a different mental, imaginative, and emotional and embodied opportunity for us. And um, so, to really, first of all, be really present with that, and um, Let's see, I'm looking to see if I made some notes here. Yeah, that, uh, that we've made space. And, um, and, and so how might we engage differently in that space rather than, I, a word that came to me the other day is biding, biding, where a lot of people are just waiting, you know, and there's an appropriateness to that waiting um, because there's so much we don't know. There's so much uncertainty. But, but it, and in, in addition to waiting, um, are there ways that we, we might want to practice different relationship with the earth now? 
different relationship with our loved ones, even if we can't be with them. Different uh, relationship with dreams, with um, with our what we're imagining. Different relationship with the kinds of things that we read or the the input that we have, um, <clears throat> and to be mindful of that because this time will change. This space will, this is going to be different. We don't know what's going to fill it, but it will be different. And so like, um, like the vision fast time, you know, there's, you know, that there's, we suggest ways for people to be in sacred reciprocity, to stay conscious um, and participatory in that vision fast time without trying to take ourselves away from what's happening, but deeper into what is happening. Yeah, so, so beautiful. Yeah. Did, I, did I answer your question? You did, yes, you did. And just that, it was beautiful, the space, you know, that even just the space of having our routines totally interrupted, you know, and for opening. I've heard so many stories of people say like, oh, I've always wanted to do this thing and now I'm doing it or just reassessing what's priority. Um, yeah. And also how we connect to the noetic, to the inner world, to the dream world, to the earth. Like you said, I think it's um, just in this point of immense possibility. Yes. Um, and like you also mentioned grief, you know, it's like the wholeness of, of what's happening or what might arise for people at this time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I have one final bonus question for you. <laughs> <laughs> not not pre-planned, um, but is there something that you found with your experience of working with individuals um, that helps them to integrate or move forward with an initiation maybe after they have a powerful vision or a dream is there something that you found of how people can work with that that has been successful for you um well there's always many things that we might suggest but the simplest thing is uh william stafford has a poem <clears throat> called The Way It Is. I probably won't have this exactly right, but he says, there's a thread that you follow. There's a thread that you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are doing. You have to explain about the thread, but it is difficult because others can't see it. And so the poem goes on from there, but <clears throat> But it's kind of like the mystery journey is like following bits of the mystery and saying yes and letting the mystery know that you've heard and seen. So something that we might suggest, um, like with dreams, dream is write them down, but maybe not stop there, especially if it's a big moving dream. Draw the images. Uh, sculpt the images, make art, um, enact the dreams. If there's body movements in the dreams, um, take on the postures and let the let that work on the the body and see what comes. Um, write love poems to the mystery, and uh, and it's following. And then when there's sometimes then we might get a big idea that, oh, now I need to do this. And maybe this is my life, you know, direction. And we might call that, that yes, do enact, you know, offer something and see what the response is. And then, and that enactment might tell you, well, this is good, but this is not quite. So maybe, this direction a little bit and um but it's to continue to say yes and to continue to listen and to be in the conversation with these very mysterious images and impressions and so on to be in the conversation as much as possible 
in the language of the mystery, which is almost likely, almost certainly not math. <laughs> <laughs> it could be, <laughs> but it might not be. The imaginal realms, I was just thinking about the imaginal yeah. cells and this dreaming and enacting and being in reciprocity um, points us to this stage of imagining for yes. ourselves and for the collective. We, what is next? We can't see it yet, but if we can attune to this depth um, rather than just going back, like when can we go back to the caterpillar? It's like, yes. no, what are we visioning for creation and of the, the butterfly? So, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for your um, time and your wisdom and just sharing with us this perspective and some practices that we can all be doing right now in this potent pause, you know, in this moment uh, before everything starts back up. And um, yeah, any final words that you'd like to say? Hmm. Oh, I, I, I probably have essays I could say. <laughs> 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 but I, that's that's good. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you, Janine, and thank you all for for tuning in. You can tune into um, actually, what's the website that they can go to to find um, your writings or more information about you? Um, animus, A N I M A S, which is Spanish for souls. Animus.org is our organization, and there's at least some, probably some links there for my writing, and uh, and they can sign up for the musing, the Animus musing, which has been coming out every Friday. I'm currently the one writing that, and sometimes it's Bill Plotkin, or it might be other guides, so, uh, and, yeah. So there you Great. go. Great. Well, we'll send out that link for everyone. So please do follow up that. And thank you all thank for joining you. in. And thank you, Janine. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs>